see if I can find them. Dr. Nicholas Carderas, welcome to the podcast. Uh, good to be here, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I see in the background digital madness uh, on your uh, right behind you, and and you are, I believe, the one of the world's foremost, or maybe the world's foremost, uh, expert on digital addictions. And digital addiction is definitely a thing. I mean, I think everybody sees it. You know, you get on an airplane and the pilot is playing with his phone, scrolling through something in the front of the plane, and you know that's a little bit scary. You know, you wonder what's happening in the cockpit. <laughs> And, you know, surgeons right. and doctors and, and nurses, like everybody has their phone out, you know, no matter who yeah, they yeah. are. A couple of years do. ago, by the way, there were two pilots that missed landing at, at O'Hare Airport in Chicago because they were on their laptops and they missed their landing because of their, they were distracted on their own laptops. And then they, they got disciplined. But just just to chime in on your pilots on, on screens. Um, oh, wow. Comment. Well, yeah. And, and of course, every kid, every kid is glued to their phone. Like, and, and I don't think anyone knows what to do about it. And where does it end? And. I'm probably one of the few people, you know, in, in the country uh, that doesn't, I don't have my phone in the house with me. And, and this is kind of an accidental thing. Um, everybody who brings their phone into our house has to clean it. You know, we all have to wipe our phones off with alcohol and um, and clean them. And I don't like cleaning my phone. Uh, not all the time. I do it occasionally. But so I've, I've opted to just leave mine out on a little table in the garage where it charges. So I'm the only person in the family that doesn't have my phone with me everywhere I go in the house. <laughs> and it's a definitely an interesting experience, you know, like they're all scrolling nonstop while we're watching TV, yeah. eating dinner, everything. And like, well, I'm like looking around and I'm like, you know, it just never stops. They never, there's never any separation. Um, where, where are we going with all this, with this digital <laughs> addiction? I mean, I see it gets worse than that though. Apparently people can get psychosis and actually have a breakdown and believe they're still in the middle of a game when the game is over. And right. um, yeah, please tell us a little bit more about what can, how far this can go, this digital addiction. Yeah. So, and, and thank you, by the way, for the introduction. Yeah. I mean, people say I'm uh, I'm one of the foremost people on the subject because I discovered it. I was one of the first people that really began to look around the social landscape. And uh, as an addiction psychologist, who, by the way, you know, I'm also in long-term personal recovery from substance addiction for 24 years. Um, I had been working at, in uh, treatment centers and running programs. And I was a professor at Stony Brook Medicine and, you know, about 10 years ago, I was looking around and seeing what you just mentioned, children, kids, adults, and they were beginning to show all the telltale signs of habituation or we, what we might call an addictive behavior. And the problem, and, and you mentioned some of the extremes of which I've worked with, everything from gaming psychosis to um, uh, a indoctrination via social media. You know, I've been an expert witness on the capital murder case where there teenage boy was YouTube indoctrinated into a political ideology where he committed uh, horrific crimes. And so, um, yeah, this is, this is the, the land, the, the, the water that we're all swimming in now is this digital immersion that we're all in and it's affecting all of us, but some of us are more vulnerable to these effects than others. So obviously children and adolescents and young adults, but what I write a lot about, what I try to speak out about now is what's the price that we're paying for our love affair with our shiny devices. Because when I wrote my first book, Glow Kids, in 2016, I wrote an article for the New York Post called Digital Heroin. And I was analogizing it to, because the brain imaging research had just come out at that point, and the brain imaging research was showing that the effects on the brain uh, of screen time was very similar, almost exactly the same as chronic substance addiction. And so I was one of the first Paul Revere, you know, kind of, hey, this is, this is a, a, a new impactful phenomenon. And so first I had to raise the awareness that, that this is habit forming. And I got a lot of pushback at the time, you know, that digital heroin article went viral and I was on Good Morning America and CNN and a lot of news shows basically having to defend that people could become addicted or habituated to their devices. Now that's been asked and answered. It's an official diagnosis. I think we've all seen it. The bigger question that I look at with digital madness is what is that addiction leading to? And, and here we have to look at our mental health metrics, uh, our rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, overdose, ADHD. By all conceivable mental health metrics, we're on fire. We're at the worst that we've ever been pre-COVID. Uh, in 2019, we're the highest rates of suicide and overdose um, and depression. And then COVID was kerosene on that fire because the isolation, quarantine, and even more screen dependence led to these things. So what I try to talk about is it's it's antithetical to the way that we were all genetically designed to live as human beings. 
We're meant to be physically active, social, um, face-to-face social interaction. And think about what screen time is. It's a nuclear bomb to, uh, so we're more sedentary now. So you have all these childhood rates of obesity and diabetes, and we have more heart disease and cancers. So we weren't meant to be sedentary, screen staring, isolated, atomized, meaning devoid, because screen time also sucks some of the humanity and some of the, um, you know, some of the young people I work with, there, there, there's an emptiness there that happens. So it's not just addicting us, but it's also changing us. I think it's taking, it's, it's vacuuming out some of the core pieces of what make us human. And, and I'm not saying let's go Amish, but we were essentially like drunken sailors when all our iPhones first came out and we weren't thoughtful enough about what might be some of the downsides of this. And now we're beginning to see some of those impacts. Yeah. So, so maybe uh, to start out with it, rather than suggesting that we all throw our phones in the garbage and, and don't look back, that um, you know, maybe we start with harm reduction of like being aware of it and and seeing what what small improvements we can make. Um, you know, I think that sounds seems like it would make sense. Yeah, and and one of the things I, I like to talk about too is um, you know, when we look at screen time, not all screen time is created is created equal. If you're you know zooming with grandma, that's a healthier use of technology. If you're gaming eighteen hours a day, you know, I've worked with adolescent young adult gamers who you know if you if if you google world of warcraft and uh, adult diapers you're going to find entire chat rooms of 18 year olds discussing which type of depends to wear because they'll be gaming for three or four days in a row without eating or going to the bathroom without sleeping all the telltale signs the hallmarks of addiction so um what i talk about there's that but then there's also social media and social media has swallowed up the world and you know when we look at the political polarization or experiencing the spike in influencers and psychiatric influencers. So you don't just have the Kardashians and the Kylie Jenners of the world, but now you have some psychiatric influencers that have dissociative identity disorder or borderline personality disorder, and their followers, are be, their, which are legion, these psychiatric influencers are getting billions of views. Now these oftentimes adolescent girls are mimicking some of their psychiatric issues. So what I talk about is strengthening our psychological immune system, right? Because we're not going to change the world. We're not going to be able to put the toothpaste back in the tube with social media or with technology. And and this is a metaphor, by the way, that I learned in my substance recovery early on, is that being in recovery doesn't make the ocean less turbulent, but we be- learn how to become better swimmers. And so part of my narrative is how can we help our children and our loved ones and ourselves become better swimmers in this toxic stew of digital overload of, you know, there are people that are doom scrolling and, and, you know, it's exacerbating the depression and, you know, the world is ending in five years. If you, you know, if you're, if you were to believe all the content that we're seeing, and then we have children that just aren't developmentally far enough in their brain development to moderate. So, so I talk about age appropriate technology usage. Uh, If you're a parent, delay the onset of screen time for your kids for at least for individual screens uh, like an iphone or a chromebook till at least eighth grade because at least the brain develops a little bit more at that point and there's a little bit more impulse control as human beings us uh, as adult human beings rather leaning into uh, leaning into face-to-face socialization physical activity hobbies that give us a sense of passion in our lives that aren't, aren't based on being online. So like I do a once a week digital fast where, you know, my family and I, you know, there's one day a week where we all unplug. Nobody gets on a device. We do something outdoors or together. And that helps reset us a little bit. That helps kind of reset, uh, you know, for those who have kind of moderate issues or want to be a little insulated. I talk about uh, helping children develop uh, the skill of critical thinking so they can discern what they read online because social media is, if nothing else, but it's an emotions economy. And what drives engagement is things that tickle our lizard brain. So fear and, you know, and I'm, I hate the words misinformation, disinformation, because I'm an anti-censor. I'm a libertarian by by predilection. But um, But can we help our young people discern what they're reading and use a critical lens to be able to, can we teach them those basic skill sets? Can we teach them how to think rationally rather than emotionally? Because 
right now, a lot of the clients, I have a treatment program in Austin, Texas, where we treat young adult clients. And it's incredible to see uh, the fragility, uh, the psychological fragility uh, of some of our young people who have been raised in this digital stew. Um, it doesn't engender resilience. It doesn't engender a lot of things that really make for a healthy human being. So pumping yeah. the brakes and, and beginning to moderate is is to not, as the adults, to not be so drunk on our devices that we lose sight of our five-year-olds who, you know, don't drop the Chromebook into the crib, essentially. Don't drink the Kool-Aid of big tech and think that your 18-month-old is going to be somehow behind if, because uh, that's a narrative I hear a lot by parents that I've worked with is, well, little Johnny or Caesar are going to be behind if they don't have a, a an iPhone when they're three, it's like, no, no, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, the Google boys, they were Montessori students. They didn't have tech till they were late teenagers. Jeff Bezos was a Montessori student. He didn't have uh, any technology. So their brains were allowed to develop creatively, uh, robustly. And then they were able to navigate into uh, science and IT and all the things that they did. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. And um, yeah, no, none of them, I mean, this is all, like what we're seeing now is unprecedented. Uh, all those guys had, you know, the early, early technology, you know, like I, I grew up with a personal computer, you know, I think we got our first computer when I was, yeah, when I was 13, we got, we had an Apple two plus and, um, mm -hmm. and I had wanted it for a long time because it had already been out for a while. And all my friends were talking about, you know, friends were getting computers and you know, we finally got it and it, it was uh, great. And, and we actually did get connected. You know, that was like, after mm -hmm. we got it, I'm like, you know, can we get the modem now? And it didn't connect to the internet. It connected to to like local uh, internet, right. like bulletin board things. And, uh, you know, right. there, there was, right. you know, we all had our fun. It was kind of the, I guess, similar. But now it, it is kind of like how drugs, like how you, you know, one time in history, they had the cocoa leaf and people would chew on it to get some energy. And then somebody figured out how to make cocaine, which was like highly addictive. And some, then someone figured out how to make freebase and crack. And uh, and and it just kept getting more and more addictive and, and more dangerous. And um you know, we're going definitely, I think, going that way. And and I actually had a book. I, I, I ordered a book on Amazon. I read a little bit about it, but it was by a uh, psychologist about, you know, instructing people on how to make games and, and things like games more addicting. Like they, they actually have, uh, there's a science of making these things more addicting. And, um, you know, it's, so it's definitely, I think, following that evolution of refining more and more to, you know, to keep people more engaged and, and do all the bad things that, that we're worried about here, you know, of, of figuring out what do they want? How can we manipulate them? How can we keep them here longer and get them to whatever, pay more money? Right. I, um, you know, so or, or I guess, and, and, yeah, oh, go ahead. Well, you know, it's the same, Mark, and that's really the problem. There's an intentionality behind this. This isn't addiction by accident, right? Yeah. This isn't like, oh, wow, we created these cool devices and people happen to, you know, you mentioned, you know, in Peru, chewing the coca leaves and all of a sudden there were you know, a group of people figured out, well, if we process these coca leaves, we can make them, you know, coca leaves 2.0. Um, yeah. I'm involved right now. There's two massive class action lawsuits, um, one against the gaming industry and one against social media companies, multi-state, multi, you know, they've gotten a lot of news coverage. I'm an expert witness and consultant on these class action lawsuits. And what they're targeting is exactly what you're saying. Um, there's an intentionality to purposely uh, habituate us or addict us to these devices targeting the most vulnerable because we know as i said before you know if you target a adolescent female and you send her content about her body if 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 the because they're using um algorithms predator you know in a very predatory way these algorithms act as heat-seeking missiles finding people's psychological vulnerability so if if a social media platform senses via profile of a young female that she's got body image issues she's going to get bombarded by toxic content about uh, hashtag skull and bone, uh, uh, skin and bones, uh, 100 calories or less, visual images of uh, anorexia. These are all images that make their, uh, exacerbate their eating disorders, but also you can't look away. You can't stop the rubbernecking effect and increases engagement because it activates their emotional lizard brain. And so, you know, the Facebook whistleblower, a woman called Frances Hogan, who testified in front of Congress about a year and a half ago, she released and revealed the internal emails and research of Meta and Instagram. And they had their own research three years ago showing that suicide rates were going up as a result of being, you know, if you were a teenage girl on Instagram, 
your the likelihood of having suicidal thoughts or actions went up 12 percent they knew that and in the internal emails the conversation was well should we dampen down the algorithm and make it a little bit less toxic and the answer was hell no because that's going to decrease engagement so the lawsuits that i'm involved with uh, are following the oxycontin purdue pharmaceutical playbook and the big tobacco playbook saying um you harmed there's a there's hundreds of plaintiffs on this class action suit people have been harmed by design intentionally you knew that these products were harmful you knew that they were habit forming because you made them habit forming because you know if you if you watch the documentary the social dilemma you know they pull back the curtain and these are the heads of the big tech companies who said oh yeah guilty as charged we did these we made these intentionally habituating um i don't think they, they intended to kill people but we know that for some really vulnerable people this was a dangerous intersection and and you know people have died there's been suicides you know just two weeks ago you had mark zuckerberg in front of the senate getting up i don't know if you saw it and turning around yeah. and apologizing to the families in the gallery who were holding the pictures up of their kids who had committed suicide as a result of some toxic content on on instagram and facebook so um a pox on their houses because it's one thing you know i, I you know people ask me, well what's the difference between you know, our kids get a obsessed with other toys or gadgets what's the difference between an iphone and you know um pick of any childhood toy and you know what i typically say is you know while we've always had manufacturers that have targeted children with jingles and with all sorts of things to have kids buy stuff um they're using as you mentioned behavior modification 2.0 really insidious manipulative techniques by design that are now proven to be harmful to kids and they haven't so the lawsuits are looking for warning labels they're not just looking for um the the families to get settlements but they're also looking for legislative changes in how these platforms operate like with social media in particular um they can't be sued right now there is a thing called section 230 which was the americans communications decency act from the 1970s which had nothing to do with social media but essentially they're saying we're not publishers of our content. We're, we're, we're just an independent third party. And if other people are posting toxic content, we shouldn't be responsible or shouldn't be sued for that. Um, that argument, I don't think holds water. The lawyers that I'm working with don't think it holds water because um, the analogy is like if uh, you go to your local grocery store and there's a bulletin board in the vestibule and that bulletin board will have you know, people will post ads on that bulletin board, you know, one bedroom apartment, car for sale. Well, if somebody posts on that bulletin board, you know, Ku Klux Klan meeting tonight, the grocery store is going to say, well, we're not responsible for that Klan meeting. We didn't post it. That was just put up on our bulletin board. We're just the uh, neutral third party. The difference with social media companies is they will take those bulletin board messages like that Klan meeting. They'll amplify the messaging. They'll gatekeeper it and they'll send it to those folks who are vulnerable to going to a Klan meeting. And so there is a difference between them being uh, neutral third parties and gatekeepers of some of the toxic content, which I think gives them liability for some of the stuff that we're seeing uh, happening. Yeah, yeah, it does seem like um, algorithmic curation of content should be considered an analogous to to creating content. Uh, it it yeah. is a, like a form of meta content. And, and so they, exactly. they really should be responsible. That's a perfect way of saying it. It's meta content. So, because you're manipulating the messaging, whether you wrote it or not, you're shaping, manipulating, and recreating it in the meta way, exactly as you said. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and of course, coincidentally, um, Mark Zuckerberg renamed his company Meta. So, you know, he's, <laughs> but that, that's, well, that's, that's when he wanted, that's when he wanted us all living in the metaverse, right? Living all in the virtual reality world controlled by the Zuck. You know, it was. I, you know, yeah. I grew up a Star Trek fan. Full disclosure, I grew up a Trekkie. You know, the original series, Kirk, Spock. And so Gene Roddenberry was a, a tech utopianist. You know, so I was, I was shaped as a kid believing that technology was going to be the panacea. You know, because in Star Trek, there were no wars. There was peace. Nobody it was, you know, nobody, they, there was no more currency. It was this Shangri-La utopia. And, and so that was how I was wired as I, you know, went into my adolescence and young adulthood. And then you know, you begin to see that, oh, there, there's, this is sort of a Faustian deal that, yeah, technology is wonderful in a lot of ways, but there's a price to pay. 
and and we weren't fully aware of that price to pay until we started seeing some of the the wreckage of our love affair with technology yeah i mean some technology is definitely good i mean plumbing um antibiotics i mean you know there's definitely technology in the last sure. uh, few centuries and and maybe even recently and um but uh th now the idea of going after these these big companies like big tobacco and and purdue is is intriguing because um going after the uh the top dealers with fentanyl and cocaine and methamphetamine that, that's that's not so easy because those are really scary people you know there's mm -hmm. um you know people with armies and and stuff that that uh, you right. know they're like their own country and uh right. and so you know if i if i were a um, federal agent in charge of going after drug dealers i would not want to have to go after those people with a whole army behind them and i probably would want to start with you know so and not that it's easy to go after big tech because they're wealthier than anybody you know they they dwarf the entertainment industry you know people like to say like well any big tech company could could buy disney easily you know they you know they just these people don't i, I don't think realize how much bigger they are financially as far as their value and, and their power compared to companies that we think are big um and uh you know but at the same time you know who the the dealers are right there they have them in congressional hearings sitting at a table there's right. there's our big dealers of the uh, drug dealers of tech right if you're a DEA agent, you'd rather go after Zuckerberg than the cartels, you know, for, for personal reasons. But, you know, you're right, because the the cap valuation of, I mean, $2 trillion, I mean, these are, we shouldn't make any mistake about this. These are the wealthiest, most powerful, the tech oligarchs, five or six people at the top of the food chain and big tech are the, not just wealthiest, but the most powerful people that have ever lived, because they don't just control a commodity. You know, I wrote in Digital Madness, I was looking at J.D. Rockefeller, who had Standard Oil and who had, you know, cornered the market on oil. He controlled 90% of U.S. oil and he became the wealthiest man in the world. But he controlled one commodity, oil. These folks control, they're not ultra wealthy. They're not just monetarily flush, but they can, they're the gatekeepers of what we see, what we think, how they shape our reality. So in a very real way, they're the most powerful people that have ever lived. And what I wrote about in Digital Madness is we haven't fully appreciated how ruthless they've been, not only in their, their they've violated antitrust laws, that beyond a doubt, they've been in front of Senate antitrust committees. I mean, um, when you look at Jeff Bezos's playbook in terms of gobbling up Amazon's competition, or same thing with Zuckerberg, you know, when he gobbled up WhatsApp and all his competitors, they use really ruthless uh, business principles and they've skirted around monopoly antitrust laws um and people i think were sort of lulled because hey gee whiz these were the tech nerds right they didn't look like gordon gecko from wall street or jd rockefeller who looked like robber barons and these like nefarious folks and so and and, and from a cultural standpoint when bill gates came out of seattle and steve jobs came out of the bay area they were part of a counterculture Demo democratization movement, right? Because before them, and I write about this in Digital Madness, big tech was Hewlett Packard and IBM. And, and they were these monolithic corporate entities. And so the garage boys, you know, the, the guys out of Stanford that were, you know, tinkering around with their um, uh, circuit boards in the garage were, became counterculture heroes. So, you know, Steve Jobs with his black turtleneck was, was you know, became this, uh, you know, there's that that iconic Apple ad. Remember where they they, they had the it was kind of a 1984 ad where they showed the Big Brother, and then that uh, there's a I don't know if you remember, but the, this woman uh, Olympian throws the hammer at the Big Brother screen, and this was going to be what was going to make us all the democratization of information, and now it kind of the worm has turned, and now they've become the the corporate overlords. Uh, in ways that I think we were all lulled into thinking, oh, well, these guys are just the cool garage guys. They're not going to, you know, hurt us in any way. Who, who's afraid of the, the tech geeks? Um, so I think that was yeah. part of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, um, and it is still there's still some appeal to that, and and there's um, different parts of the tech movement. You know, there, there's open source, and 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 the the people right. that are you know fighting for for access to to free software that's not controlled and there's a, so there are there are good people out there and um uh, you know like i i kind of like um things like wordpress and the um oh the, the matt mullenweg the creative wordpress and I, I don't know if he's a uh billionaire and if he has what his uh 
you know, I, I don't think he's creating content or doing these algorithms, but it's really, I like to listen to his interviews where he's like very much in favor of people having their own voice and their own agency and being able to be their own platform. And well, that, I think well, that's, that's like true. a positive thing. What I think what's what's missing though in, in you know, even open AI or chat GBT, with a lot of, uh, you know, I write about this also in Digital Madness, you know, there's with a lot of scientific innovators currently in the last 50 years, they're not getting the ethics training. They don't have ethical discernment. So they get very myopic in their Frankenstein monster pursuits, right? So Dr. Frankenstein was in search of creating life. And they didn't really think about what would happen if the monster runs amok. And so when a lot of these myopic scientists or tech developers, they've got their eye on the prize, but they're not thinking six generations ahead. They're not thinking what happens if the monster escapes the containment what happens with with artificial intelligence or artificial generalized intelligence, sentience awareness, which, you know, Elon Musk has warned people quite a bit about, you know, like this is one of the most frightening things that can go sideways. But you have a lot of these innovators who are just so tunnel visioned. Ray Kurzweil is the high priest of the tech industry. You know, he was a Google senior guy, Caltech, you know, genius. But he, in this book, he writes about it. The, the singularity is near it's almost a messianic vision of the future. They think that the next generation of human evolution is going to be this merger of AI or the, a cloud-like AI and humanity, that we're, we're, that this is going to be what's coming next. And they're not, they're not fully looking at what the unintended consequences of some of their innovations can be because they're too drunk on their own innovation. That's where I'd say, you know, there needs to be more ethicists at the table to say, wait a second, or at least some oversight committee that at least is kind of reining in some of innovations. Because like you said, wonderful use of technology. We've invented antibiotics and cures to illnesses, but maybe we've also let some viruses run loose because of um, research without enough oversight. So, you know, things like that, that kind of worries me as we go, in, as we go boldly into the future, because um, the technology is getting exponentially more powerful and will we lose containment? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, um, that would be good to have, you know, to bring eth ethics into it. And, and, and I know that there was some discussion with, um, you know, the AI people talking about holding back and slowing things down and, and looking at, at that. Um, right. and now with, with gaming and, and, uh, you know, I think some people were under the impression, uh, as this technology developed that, that it was, you know, like, like 3D gaming, you know, being in a first person shooter game, you know, like, which can be, you know, apparently if, if kids are wearing adult diapers and gaming 24 hours a day, that's not good. But at, at one point there were studies that were being published or in the news saying that it was good for people, that it was good for brain development, that you could actually get smarter by running around on a 3D world. But, you know, I guess like the, the downside, you know, kind of like how caffeine and, you know, sometimes they say it's good, sometimes they say it's bad. And we used to think cigarettes were healthy, but, I, you know, I guess maybe the, the, the downside is worse than the, the upside. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it in Glow Kids. The only research that they showed that was beneficial with gaming was that there was an improvement of what's called the salience network of the brain. And that's really like your hand-eye coordination, right? So if you want to be a drone pilot, you know, um, good. It's good for your some of your hand-eye development. But the, the price to pay, the Faustian deal, is increased depression, anxiety, um, yeah. and the addictive factor, right? Uh, and, you know, I've worked with some games. They were gaming 24 seven, escaping the real world in two dimensional gaming platforms. And that one of my, I still remember the day one of my gamers played League of Legends in the virtual uh, realm. And he came into my office shaking, saying, oh my God, that was such a powerful, amazing experience. I don't think I will, I would ever voluntarily leave that. And I mean, oh, you know, wow. he was insightful enough to realize that this candy was really tasty. <laughs> and that's what I talk about. I talk about that we've created really honey-coated digital cages. They really taste great, but we're in a cage now at the end of the day. And, and not only are we in the cage, but we formed a form of Stockholm syndrome where we've, you know, rock-starred our tech moguls. The guys who are habituating us, manipulating us, and imprisoning us in these digital cages, we've made them, you know, cultural icons. So, yeah, there's that. Yeah, it, um... Yeah, it remind when you were talking about Frankenstein, it reminds me there was that that line from um, Jurassic Park, which I guess is also kind of a, a, an analogy of of what's happening. Right. right. Where um, the uh, the the mathematician 
guy and he said he says uh your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could they didn't stop to think if they should and that's it yeah oh, i think perfect. that's what you're describing there here yeah it's the uh peril there's a name for it uh and i'm having a senior moment the peril something um paradox um peril rewards it basically means a peril reward paradox you know what's and and you're exactly right just because you could doesn't mean you should and um and that's what we're not seeing enough of we're not seeing enough of pumping the brakes and let's face it you know big tech oligarchs they're driven by they're not driven by our well-being or our good they're driven by uh you know there's a profit agenda and there's other i think other agendas as well but um but so what can we do as people? I think we have to be aware. We have to have clarity of mind and vision to see what's happening in the cultural landscape to be able to say, this seems appropriate for me and my family to do. This doesn't. And and, and how can I lean into my humanity? Because it'll be really easy 20 years from now to have us all sitting in easy boys with their own toilet seats and, and you know, a vision pro virtual reality headset on living in escapist fantasy worlds going back to star trek the pilot episode of star trek the cage captain pike uh you know is is a quadriplegic and a terrible burn victim and he gets given the choice to go to essentially a virtual reality planet where he has the illusion of being young and healthy and um you know dating green women um mm -hmm. versus being uh, a nonverbal quadriplegic in a wheelchair, and he opts for the illusion. Um, so I look, I'm an addiction psychologist. I get why people lean towards escapism and self-medicating. You know, if your everyday life is untenable, if you're suffering from mental health issues, depression, anxiety, you don't feel vertical mobility in your life, you're going to lean into the opioids or to alcohol or to other issues. The problem with virtual reality is it's so ubiquitous and so easy to access that, um, it, it, it's going to be a more seductive escape and the more available escape than the current ones that we have. Yeah. Yeah, def definitely. Um, so uh, doc Dr. Nicholas Carderas, a uh, world's foremost expert on, on digital addiction and your, your book is digital madness. Uh, and, and people can find that on Amazon. Is that the best place to, to get your book? Yeah. Amazon, unfortunately got to dance with the devil. <laughs> oh, to yeah, be yeah. <laughs> to sell books, but yeah. Amazon, my, and the book before that was Glow Kids that looked a little bit more at uh, children and uh, the mental health effects of kids and screen time. So Glow Kids was 2016. Digital Madness is the book that came out this year. Looks at more social media and our mental health crisis. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Nicholas Carderas, for, for joining me today on the podcast. Thank you, Mark, for having me and uh, have a wonderful day. Oh, you too. Thank you.